Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to this teaching class from the Thames Valley and Watford Churches of Christ, based on the book of 1 Thessalonians. And today we're in chapter 2, looking at verses 13 to 20, and the topic is about suffering. Yes, that may not sound like a very exciting topic, but I think you're going to find some things that will encourage your faith and help your endurance in uh, Christ. And also, particularly, we're going to be looking at how to how to support people when they suffer. So it's partly about our suffering, and it's partly about how we help others when they suffer. And since we are a Christian community, one of the most important functions we can um, uh, have for one another, with one another, is to learn how to appropriately support one another when we suffer. There's, there are some pitfalls to avoid, and there are some practices which are healthy. And we're going to look at some of those today from this passage in chapter 2 which of course won't cover everything we could say about this topic, but I hope will provide some good stimulus for conversations in our local groups about how we do this effectively and healthily. So let's first of all have a look at our passage here. We're in chapter 2, we're in verse 13, and we're reading to the end of the chapter. So Paul's just been talking about how he has been with them, like a young child, like a nursing mother, like a loving father. And then he says in verse 13, uh, we also thank God continually, keeping them in his prayers there, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God. And I'm just going to stop there for a moment. You see the difference here between receive, uh, uh, receiving and accepting. We can receive something, but not truly accept it. You can receive a gift, a present. You still got to unwrap it and, and, and bring it into your home and into your life. He says it's not only the f fact that you received the word of God from us, but the fact that you accepted it, that makes all the difference. And this is still true in the way that we continue to live as Christians. It's not just that we hear the word of God like today in a lesson like this, but that we accept it. We draw it into our lives. We apply it. And then we see its power at work. And one of the things that happened for them when they not only received but accepted the word of God is that they suffered as a result, which you know, is one of those tricky things in the Christian life. Uh, we get the joy of the spirit. We get the peace that passes understanding. And we get the persecutions that Jesus promised in the Beatitudes and other places. Anyway, we go on. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. He's talking there about the churches that were first established in Jerusalem and in that area in the early days of Christianity. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. So the local Gentile and Jewish persecution in Thessalonica is similar to what happened in the early days of Christianity who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God, hostile to everyone. He's not being anti-Semitic here. He's just saying that in that context, it was Jewish people that that uh, uh, persecuted the early Christians. As someone once said, it's like the, uh, the Jewish leaders loaded the gun, but the Romans pulled the trigger when they crucified Jesus Christ. And he says, in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles, uh, so that they may be saved. And this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last, or it probably is coming. Maybe Paul can envisage what's going to happen in AD 70, not, not, not far around the corner on its way. So he's talking about the fact that you suffered. And of course, we do suffer. And before we go on to talk about how we help people in their suffering, we've got to figure out a little bit of how to deal with our own. And again, this is very limited what I can say right now. But we do have to reckon with the question, why do we suffer? Why do we suffer as Christians? Why do we suffer as Christian communities? Part of the reason is that we live in a fallen world. Uh, what is just and right will not always take place in this world because it's a fallen world. Uh, if Jesus suffered and was treated unjustly, then so will we be. And I will just say this to people who sometimes say, well, if there's no justice in this world, then why should I be a Christian? You should be a Christian because you're on the side of justice. No one was more on the side of justice than Jesus Christ himself. He wanted to see justice done, and he went around doing good to as many people as he could in his life, lifetime so that more and more people could experience the goodness of God and the justice of God in their lives, even if they were marginalized and pushed out by people in, the low, in, in that time, in that, uh, in that culture, by the leaders, by other people, by their family. He went around incorporating and bringing people in and giving them as much justice as they could get in this life. And so if you want to work with the only one who truly understands what is truly what is just and with his strength and his power and his wisdom, then be a Christian and work for justice in this world. Work with the one who will see justice done eventually anyway. 
confidence in him. Our confidence is in him because he has a commitment to justice uh, since he made the greatest sacrifice for justice by sending Jesus to die for our sins. The other reason why there's suffering in this world is that some prefer darkness. John chapter 3 verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Some people love darkness. That's just the way that they have decided to live. And the third reason that we suffer is because it helps us to grow, doesn't it? James chapter 1 verses 2 to 4, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's one of the ways we learn, perhaps it's the best way we learn anything and grow in anything is by suffering. Suffering is a theme in First Thessalonians. Look it up if you want to do a Bible study on that. I would suggest you do a little exercise for yourself. You could do it as a group or just for yourself, which is to take a moment quietly sitting or somewhere quiet. Close your eyes. Bring to mind your area of greatest suffering and then surrender it to God, calling on him to help you trust him that you can handle it and that he will bring good out of it in some way at some point. Might be a useful exercise. So having reckoned a little bit as to why we suffer, they suffered because the people opposed them, because they didn't like what uh, what was going on. It seems that they were jealous, of course. We look in, uh, in Acts chapter 17, the record of what happened in Thessalonica. It says that there's some people that were jealous started the riots that ended up getting Paul and his companions kicked out of town. So there's various reasons why it has happened to them. And then he goes on in verse 17 to say these beautiful, these beautiful uh, things. He says, brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. But we wanted to come to you. Certainly, Paul, I did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope? our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. We learn a lot here about how to help people when they suffer. Here's Paul uh, down in Athens, hearing about the suffering of the Thessalonians, really wants to do something about it. He's feeling orphaned, torn away from them. Uh, this is the, the sense of, uh, like, like in, in currently there's a war in Ukraine and families have been separated, fathers from their children uh, and, and, to a large extent, and, and just that sense of having to leave and be orphaned in, in a way. This is how Paul feels about the Thessalonians. This is how much he has them in his heart. This is how hopefully we feel when, by force of circumstances outside our control, we can't see our fellow brothers and sisters in our local ministry uh, feeling orphaned. Oh, I, I'm separated from you against my will. In person, he says, we're separated, of course, not in thought. And one of the wonderful things about Paul is how many people he kept in mind. When you read all the letters, he's always praying for these people. And that's one way to stay connected, isn't it? Even if we can't see each other as often as we might like, we can stay connected by praying. He does that. He thanks God continually for them, as he says in verse 13. That's how he's feeling. Uh, he says, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. That's the feelings he has. He wanted to come again and again. He tried. You are our hope, our joy, our crown. You are our glory and joy. See how the warmth he feels here. I think this is an example of how a community of Christians can respond to suffering within its community. Firstly, three things. Firstly, we feel their pain. We're not going to be truly a community that loves each other with the love of Christ unless we feel each other's pain. We know that, Je that Jesus felt the pain of Mary and Martha when their, when their brother Lazarus died. Uh, he wept. He wept for their pain in, in uh, sympathy with or in empathy with or, or, or just in solidarity with their pain. Jesus feels for us. We feel the pain of others. Some of that comes through prayer. I feel the joys and the pains of my fellow brothers and sisters more when I have been praying for them as well as spending time with them. There's an empathy there because of, and this was what then what drives us is a sense of love because we're connected on a love emotional level, not just on an, on an intellectual level. Oh, what does that person need? Let me get a spreadsheet out. 
nothing wrong with spreadsheets, but it's not about the spreadsheet. It's about that sense of I'm compelled to do something because of love and empathy. It's not out of guilt. It's not out of duty. It's, uh, it's not out of even a, a selfish desire to rescue someone to make ourselves feel better, which is something we have to guard against. The uh, propensity for the rescuer syndrome in many of us, and especially I think as Christians, we quite often have this tendency. It's not about us feeling good because we're now rescuing someone, but it's about empathizing with and connecting with the pain of other people. So the first thing we, we uh, is helpful to do is to feel the other person's pain. That's what he felt. Secondly, we make significant efforts to help. Significant efforts to help. In other words, not token efforts. Not just sticking a, um, a, a sad emoji into a WhatsApp message, though that's fine. But more than that, right, when someone is really suffering, we see that Paul is resourceful. He tries again and again. He made every effort. That's more than once. It's more than twice. Again and again. I don't know how many times that is, but to me, it speaks of three, four, five, six times. He tries again and again. He he doesn't want to give up. He tr keeps trying till something works. Now, we'll see in chapter three that the solution presented itself in that then Timothy was able to go. So Timothy goes instead of Paul. That's something we'll talk more about another time. But he's resourceful and he's, uh, he's determined and he's not going to give up easily. When we're trying to help someone who's suffering, if the first thing we try doesn't work, don't give up. Maybe try something else. Pray some more. Have some more conversations with people. Find another way. It's also important, I think, although it's not stated uh, specifically here, it's important that we check that the person we want to try and help actually wants our help. They may not want our help, or they may want somebody else's help, not ours, it's more useful, or it may be that now's not the right time to help, it could be tomorrow or next week. We've got to give people the uh, respect to allow them to refuse help. And so when we offer help, it should be done gently. Now, Paul uh, here, obviously, uh, it doesn't tell us whether he asked them, but we do find in chapter 3 that when Timothy is returned, then Paul says, uh, it, obviously, that visit went well, and they were glad that Paul had sent Timothy. So th Paul got it right. Uh, we can say that. Let's check before we make those efforts. Thirdly, when other people suffer, what, how do we react? We must also trust God. We hope that person will trust God, as we talked about earlier. God has got a reason for allowing these, these, these sufferings. But we also must trust God as others suffer. And perhaps sometimes it's harder to watch others suffer and to trust God for that than it is to deal with our own suffering, isn't it? Especially when they're people we really dearly love. We've got to trust God because he is more powerful than Satan. Satan blocks Paul's way, but Satan cannot prevent Timothy from going. And when Timothy gets there, he finds the church encouraged. God is still at work in that congregation despite the suffering. And so we trust God. He is more powerful than Satan, as demonstrated by raising Jesus from the dead. And also we know that in time, God will right all wrongs. He will right all wrongs. In verse 16, uh, the wrath of God has come upon them at last. It's coming. The wrath of God is coming. The justice of God is coming. God will put all things right in the end. Three things that can help us to help other people when they're suffering. Firstly, to feel their pain. Pray for them. Secondly, make significant efforts to help, but first checking that they want our help. And thirdly, trusting God because he has a purpose in it all. Here's a second exercise you might like to try like the first one, which is to close your eyes, take a moment of quiet, and think about someone you care about who is suffering. Empathize quietly. Pray and contemplate how you might be able to help. And again, offer the whole situation back to God to allow him in his sovereignty to deal with it as he sees fit and ask him to help you to trust him even as these other people suffer. What's one thing perhaps you could do this week to help that person you've been thinking about in their suffering? You might not be able to prevent them from suffering. That might not be the point. But what's one thing you could do to support them in their suffering? It might be just to pray. It might be to pray with them. It might be to go visit them. It might be to give them some advice and resources. I, whatever it is, what's one thing that you could do this week? Supporting them in their suffering. This is what a Christian community does with each other. So to wrap up, here's a thought. I think what this shows us is relationships are everything. And by relationships, I mean not connections so much as, as practical love expressed because of a heart desire. His sense of being orphaned, 
His sense of being absent from those he loved drove Paul to do what he could. And isn't this what drives our connections? What helps us to be a true Christian community, really loving one another, not just in theory or in our mind or in our feelings, but, but actually in practical terms. Showing the kind of love to one another that shows the world that we really are Christ's disciples because it's his love in us that drives us to this. I had a, a humbling experience this week, humbling and refreshing. An old friend of mine contacted me and asked me why I had been neglecting him or pulling away, I think is, is actually what he said. And I felt quite hurt at that because I didn't think I had been pulling away. And this is an old friend I've known for uh, almost 40 years as a Christian. Uh, I've actually known him for longer than I've been a Christian, fun, interesting, but also as a Christian. And he's not in this country and we don't see each other. Uh, we don't communicate very much, but he felt that I'd been pulling away and he valued the friendship and called me out on it. And my first reaction was defensive. It's like, I haven't been pulling away. And I hadn't been deliberately pulling away. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, this is one of my oldest friends. Somebody, you know those friends you have where they're not just friends, they're people you can be completely yourself with. And we should be able to be that way with everybody in the church, but there are some that you just get closer to than others. There's a certain level of vulnerability that you're able to get to with some people more than others. And this is one of those people that God put in my life, somebody who I can be really vulnerable with and who is in turn very vulnerable with me. And we've shared so many experiences, highs and lows over the decades as Christians, we could write a book or two about it all. And I realized the way that I've been with him, communicating with him over the last little while is not in the least on the level of where our relationship has been. And he was quite right. He called me to repent and he was right to do so because I haven't been showing him the kind of love that I have in the past and I know is right. And I felt, uh, I felt very, I felt very uh, convicted to use that word. Uh, I felt, I felt very sorry. I apologize to him and we've been in touch recently. We've been on the, on the phone, uh, on, uh, on uh, FaceTime, I think it was or something. We've, we got caught up properly. Um, it was wonderful. But one of the reasons I then did, in praying about it, realized that I hadn't been as much in touch with him is not to do with him personally, but to do with the fact that he reminds me of other friends I've lost that are no longer in the faith. And sometimes we have to reckon with this, my friends, that some of the reasons we don't develop depth in our current relationships that we still have for a long time or, or new ones that we have around us where we are in our local church communities, sometimes the reason we don't develop that depth is because of the pain of the past, the sense of loss. And Paul, how did he deal with his sense of loss? How did he deal with it? He dealt with it by being honest. I'm orphaned. I feel terrible. I'm going to try everything I can. And even when he's blocked and he can't go, I mean, it must have been still some pain in him there. He couldn't go. But he kept going until he find, found a way to help the people he cared about be supported, he said, Timothy. And so I just call on all of us to think about the dear and precious friendships and relationships we have, some far away, some local. And not to give up because it's difficult, not to give up because it's painful, not to give up because of hurts from the past, of getting deep and empathetic and caring and practical and trusting God about the relationships that God has given us. And why do we do all this? We do all this not because we should, but because of Jesus' love for us. That while we were still sinners, he came and loved us. For the joy set before him, he went to the cross. He endured such suffering from men because he loved us. And he wanted us to be with him. If he's prepared to make that sacrifice and he has given us the power and the Holy Spirit to be able to love like that with one another, then we can exercise that. We can do it. We can be a community which supports one another healthily when we suffer. Well, I hope you find these thoughts helpful. I'd like to know what you think. There's a lot more that could be said on this topic. So if you've got a thought, drop me an email, malcolm at malcolmcox.org. You can find more resources for the First Thessalonians series on my website, malcolmcox.org. And I hope that you are able to not only when you suffer, find others help you, but also when others suffer, that you are the one who is able to support them in their suffering. Till the next time, take care. Bye.